tonight. Uh, our topic is the United States and Russia. Is reconciliation possible? Uh, Mr. Secretary of State Tillerson last week uh, said that uh, re-engagement with Russia was the primary goal with respect to Russia. But he added that he had talked to Mr. Putin, and they both agreed that relations have never been worse. <laughs> and Mr. Tillerson said, spiraling downward. So uh, that, in a way, is the task of our, our guests this evening, is to deal with that, that question. Because nearly everybody recognizes that the two great nuclear powers of the world cannot remain at odds in a serious way uh, for a prolonged period of time. And yet we also recognize that the distance between them at this moment seems substantial, uh, even though uh, the President of the United States apparently is trying very hard to, <laughs> to establish good relations with, uh, with Russia. I can't resist saying I'm am <laughs> I'm amused by the media, though, because the concern was that the Russians might, Russians might learn something, right? Now every person on the planet will learn something. Um, so there's an interesting uh, phenomenon going on there, uh, which is uh, beyond, beyond uh, our government. But in any case, our, our topic tonight, you know, our, our speaker is Professor Robert Friedman, known to everyone. Bob and I talked about whether there should be a Baltimore Council in the 1970s, before this council was founded. He's been a great friend of the council ever since. He was good enough to speak before the council in 1981, uh, one of the first 16 speakers, uh, the first year of our operation. And he's addressed the council uh, every several years, perhaps for a dozen times since, both speaking on the Middle East uh, and on Russia, both of which, uh, both areas in which he's a, a nationally recognized authority. Uh, Bob's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, as most of you, you know, uh, in diplomatic history. His MA and PhD are from Columbia in international relations. He's been in our committee a long time, but first he taught at the United States Military Academy, Russian history, at the academy, and then he taught uh, political science and Russia at Marquette before coming here uh, to the Baltimore Hebrew University, where he was a professor there for a long time, uh, chaired the department, served as president of Baltimore Hebrew University for a number of years, and he's now a, 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 a visiting professor at Johns Hopkins. Bob's the author of 20-some books, hundreds of articles, Five of those books are on the foreign policy of either the Soviet Union or Russia. So he's retained a strong interest in Russia uh, in, in uh, nearly every facet of its, of its endeavors. Uh, Bob has also consulted with both the uh, governments of the United States and Israel, which will give him a particular vantage point with respect to some of the things that are occurring as we speak. Uh, He's headed uh, United States delegations, both to Moscow and Uzbekistan. He's been interviewed in numerous uh, uh, media outlets, both in the United States and abroad. Uh, he's been elected to important offices within professional organizations. He's a widely respected uh, uh, scholar nationally and uh, uh, serving on the board of trustees of this council now, a great friend of the council. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Robert Friedman. Uh, thank you very much, Frank, and thank you all for coming out tonight. We meet at an absolutely fascinating time in U.S.-Russian relations, as everybody who's been following the news the last few days know. On the one hand, a Russian plane, a fighter plane, buzzed a U.S. maritime patrol plane in the Black Sea a week ago, flying within 20 feet of it. U.S. Secretary of Defense James Mattis has just been in the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, talking about American troop deployments, deployments of Patriot anti-aircraft missiles, as the Baltic states are very worried, in my view, justifiably, about the threat from Moscow. <clears throat> 
in the words of Mr. Mattis, quote, we will deploy whatever capability is necessary there. Uh, the Russians in the fall, in September, are planning the Zapad in Russia, that means West, uh, military exercise just opposite the Baltic states. So what we have from the American perspective is a tripwire of a battalion at least in each of the states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, <laughs> plus lots of backup. So we'll see if the Russians get tempted or not. So that's the negative. At the same time, as we all know, President Trump met the uh, Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian Ambassador to the U.S., Sergei Kislak, and in a picture taken by TASS, can you imagine Russian photographers were allowed in, but not American photographers for that meeting? Uh, it showed Mr. Trump warmly greeting his Russian guests. The White House issued a statement following the meeting that Trump had a, quote, very, very good meeting with Lavrov, especially with regard to Syria. We're going to stop the killing and the death there. The statement also said that Trump emphasized his desire to build a better relationship between the U.S. and Russia. We also know, however, that Trump shared classified information about ISIS plots to bring down planes. Uh, usually American or NATO planes, or EU planes, but something I think interested the Russians quite a bit, and stated that he had, quote, the absolute right to do so for humanitarian reasons. I want Russia to greatly step up their fight against ISIS and terrorism, he said. Now, if it seems that what Mr. Mattis is doing and what the Russian planes buzzing the American planes are doing is one side of the equation, and the warm greeting that Mr. Trump gave the Russians is the other side of the equation, we have to turn to his national security advisor, General McMaster, who following the meeting with Lavrov and Kislyak said the following, I would characterize the meetings as engagements, not decisions. I think what the President has made clear is that he will confront Russian disruptive behavior, such as its support for the murderous Assad regime in Syria and its enabling of Iran and its very, very destructive policy and strategy that is executing across the Middle East and what, and what Russia is continuing to do in Ukraine. He will confront that disruptive behavior, said McMaster. But, he went on to say, the President is looking for areas of cooperation. There are a lot of very significant security problem sets across the world. All of them would go easier if Russia were to come to the conclusion that it would best advance its own interests, the Russian interests, through cooperation with the U.S. and others to resolve these conflicts. Well, since Mr. McMaster, or General McMaster, has posed the issue, what I want to do tonight is, again, after I examine the past track record of Mr. Putin, especially since 2012, and raise questions about his credibility, can he be trusted or not, given his habit of lying on a regular basis. We're going to look at the various security problems or security sets that General McMaster said and see whether or not the Russians can be helpful. I would like to mention, however, that while I'm not calling the administration dysfunctional, uh, although I could, <laughs> Uh, what you have here is really General McMaster and General Mattis very, very, very critical of Russia. You'll never hear those words about Russia that McMaster just mentioned coming out of Trump's mouth. Whereas Trump, President Trump, is a more positive view. We'll see if they can be recognized, uh, reconciled or not. All right, let's, let's now take a look at Putin's actions. Uh, you all recall back in 2008, just as he was leaving the presidency for the first time, the Russians annexed parts of Georgia, Abkhazia, and southern Ossetia. Um, now, when President Obama took over in 2009, he disregarded the Russian action, sought a reset with Russia, did a number of things to, what he thought, enhance the Russian-American relationship. He helped the Russians get into the World Trade Organization, uh, promised help to Russia to create a Russian Silicon Valley, 
outside of Moscow. In return, Medvedev, who I think Mr. Obama bet on would be the uh, president of Russia for many years thereafter, abstained on a strong UN sanctions vote uh, on Iran and stopped delivery of the SAM 300s to Iran. So there was a quid pro quo in the Medvedev years. But then Putin and Medvedev switched, as you might recall, Putin again running for president, Medvedev for prime minister, and the Duma elections, the Russian parliamentary elections of 2011, when Muscovites took to the streets to complain that these elections were fixed. Hillary Clinton at the time said, it's a wonderful show of democracy, what the Russians are doing, demonstrating freely in the streets. And Mr. Putin took from that that the US and Hillary in particular was trying to overthrow his regime. And he never forgot, and I think what you saw in 2016 with the interference in the American elections was payback by Putin. Well, after the uh, deal on chemical weapons, you remember in Syria in 2013, and the decision of Mr. Obama at the last minute not to strike Syria, this irregardless of the red line, I think Mr. Putin concluded that he had a fairly free hand in international affairs. He annexed Crimea in 2014, intervened with troops and heavy weaponry in eastern Ukraine, and that continues. He also openly threatened the Baltic states, as well as Sweden and Norway. Uh, the end result of that did not work out very well for Mr. Putin so far. The Nordic states, that is Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, plus Sweden and Finland and Denmark, have had much closer defense cooperation than before. Sweden has restored conscription, and both Sweden and Finland are moving a lot closer to NATO, may actually join NATO. Another thing he did domestically in the last few years, did Mr. Putin, is he murdered a lot of his domestic critics, such as Boris Nemtsov, Sergei Magnitsky, he had, there was an attack on opposition leader Alexei Navalny, and even killed opposition leaders abroad, such as Alexander Litvinenko in England. He also passed legislation that made it hard for critics to speak out in criticism of the regime or get aid from foreign non-governmental organizations. But nonetheless, as I think everybody noted, uh, just a few weeks ago, people took to the streets to condemn corruption. This was Mr. Putin's response to that. I personally support the anti-corruption issue being at the center of public attention. But political forces are taking the issue to pr promote themselves in the run-up to the presidential elections of 2018. This is a tool of the Arab Spring. We know very well what this leads to. This is the reason for the coup d'etat in the Ukraine, and it plunged that country into chaos. Basically, anything Mr. Putin cannot control is defined as chaos, in my view. All right, what else has Mr. Putin done? He's developed a ground-based intermediate-range missile, the SSC-8, in clear violation of the 1987 IRBM Intermediate-Range Ballistic Missile Treaty that banned the U.S. and the then Soviet Union from having such a missile. He buzzed U.S. ships in the Black and Baltic Seas and continues to do so. He intervened in the 2016 U.S. elections. I think it's very clear that there's an agreement across the American intelligence community that Russian intelligence operatives helped Trump win the election against Hillary Clinton by hacking into her staff's email, Mr. Podesta, leaking the damaging emails they found and spreading false information through social media designed to harm the candidacy of Mrs. Clinton. Then, again, as we know, there are ongoing investigations by the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, as well as the FBI on ties between Russia and the Trump campaign. While the White House has tried to play down the FBI investigation, saying that it was, quote, probably one of the smallest things on their agenda, <laughs> acting FBI Director Andrew McCabe, following the firing of Jim Comey, described the Russia-Trump issue as, quote, a highly significant investigation. But it's not just the Americans who the, the elections which the Russians and Putin tried to influence. He has clearly backed European politicians who want to lift sanctions on Russia, 
that is the sanctions imposed after the invasion of Crimea and the seizure of part of Ukraine, break up the European Union and also NATO. Example number one is Marine Le Pen in France, who got a loan from a Russian bank for her campaign. Disinformation, discrediting Macron, was spread by the Russians, who nonetheless, I think, suffered a blow when Macron won decisively. In Germany, the Russians have come out in support of the right-wing alternative for Germany party. They're clearly anti-Merkel because anti-Merkel is a strong force both in the EU, European Union, and in NATO. They deliberately spread lies such as the rape of a 13-year-old ethnic Russian girl living in Germany by, guess who, immigrants from the Middle East. The police investigated, found nothing to corroborate it, denounced it as a lie, but Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, said, it's true the Germans are covering it up. And this was clearly an effort to discredit Merkel and her immigration policy. You also have Russian support for the Five Star Movement in Italy, which worked to a certain extent when Prime Minister Renzi lost his referendum and had to step down for the freedom part of Austria. And that may be back up now, given the chaos in Austria and their electoral system. For UKIP in England, which supported the Brexit campaign, for Jobbik Party in Hungary, and for the Attica Party in Bulgaria. Now, if this weren't enough, guess who's sending weapons to the Taliban? The Russians, as per information from the US Defense Department. So these are some of the things that you have to take into consideration as past Russian behavior under Putin when you ask the question, can we cooperate with him? But let's also look at Putin's credibility, or as I noted in my notes, his numerous lies. Number one, it was the Syrian rebels, not the Syrian government, who used poison gas in 2013, and again most recently in 2017. There are no Russian troops in the Crimea, he said in 2014, just before it was annexed. Also, the missile that shot down a passenger plane over eastern Ukraine was fired by the Ukrainian government, not the Russian-supported Ukrainian rebels. Again, a Dutch investigatory commission made it very clear that the rebels, Russian-supported rebels, were the one who did it. Putin also claimed that Russia was intervening in Syria against ISIS. More than 80% of the Russian airstrikes were struck at non-jihadi and non-ISIS enemies of the Assad regime. He also claimed that Russia didn't intervene in the US election in 2016, despite the information we know from the American intelligence department. So if you look at all this, you have to ask yourself an open question whether or not you know, Putin is somebody we can cooperate with. Now, when we go down the questions, the key questions of Russia and peace, I think we have to take a hard look at what Mr. Putin wants in terms of what are his priorities. I would list three main priorities in this priority order. Number one, restore Russia as a great power. And the obverse of that is weaken the power of the United States, a really zero-sum game competition between the two. Number two, more business for heavy industry in Russia, whether nuclear reactors or infrastructure programs like railroads, et cetera, subways, that kind of thing, as well as arms sales. That's the second priority. And the third priority is fighting Islamic terrorism, whether ISIS or Al Qaeda. But note that's third on the priority list, not first, not second, despite what Mr. Putin has been saying. And in my view, we know this very clearly by his behavior above all in Syria, and we'll get to that in a bit. All right, let's look at some of the hot spots around the world and see where maybe there could be some cooperation. And the only bright spot, and it's not a big one, is Libya. 
which is currently convulsed by fighting between the Eastern forces under General Hafter and the UN-supported Presidential Council under Fayez el Sarraj. Now, Hafter has been supported by the Russians. He's been entertained on the Russian aircraft carrier. And the Russians are pushing very hard for him to be the defense minister of any coalition government. Now, I think the reasons for this are very clear. If he becomes defense minister, and if there's some sort of unity government, then the arms embargo against Libya gets lifted. And who is Mr. General Hifter going to buy his weapons from? Very clear from the Russians. It's $4 billion. Gaddafi had a $4 billion order for weapons from Russia not delivered because he was overthrown. Also, the Russians have still pending $5 billion in infrastructure deals with the Libyans. And conceivably, if there's a coalition government, the Russians will be able to cash in on this. Now, why do I say, well, this is, obviously it's good for the Russians. What about for the US? There are pockets of ISIS still in Libya. Uh, the U.S. has not yet taken a position and was more willing to let the Europeans, especially the Italians, play a role. And if there could be a coalition government, even if Russia benefits, it would end some of the fighting in Libya. And it's conceivable with the game of fighting ISIS that the U.S. would go along with Russia in there. Uh, that's the bright spot, folks. Now let's look at the other spots. Arab-Israeli conflict. For many, many years, Putin has been desirous of having an international conference in Moscow, bringing Israelis and Palestinians together. Mr. Abbas, the Palestinian leader, has said, we want the Russians involved in any peacemaking. As you all know, Mr. Trump is on his way now, uh, first to Saudi Arabia and then to Israel. Whether he can pull off this peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, giving the huge gap between them, is a very, very open question. But from the Russian perspective, they want to be involved. Because if they're involved, it shows we are a great power like the Soviet Union was. So the Russians will certainly want to be involved if there's any kind of peace conference. And whether they can contribute anything, however, is another question. Well, what about Afghanistan? Again, history of Afghanistan, as you know, the U.S. intervened in Afghanistan after 9-11. Uh, when Mr. Obama came in, he hoped to withdraw American troops by 2014. If you recall, he said the combat period is over. The dilemma is the Taliban <laughs> didn't listen. And since 2014, 2015, 2016, the Afghan government has been very much on the defensive and losing territory. At this point, Mr. Trump has to make a decision. He's gotten advice from the Pentagon, we need more troops. If you remember, Mr. Obama had the same kind of advice, put in tens of thousands of troops, help briefly but not lastingly, We'll see what happens here. However, I would suggest with the Russians giving weapons to the Taliban, this is not helpful for the US. Uh, the Russians have tried to play it both ways. They're sending weapons to the Taliban. They're also having meetings with the Afghans, with the Pakistanis, who are the big supporters of the Taliban, and the Chinese who border on Afghanistan on this very narrow trip trying to work out a peace settlement. The, the bottom line here is they can make the U.S. look bad in Afghanistan by strengthening the Taliban. They will do it. And the Taliban say, you know, we're happy to get weapons from the Russians because our main enemy is the United States. So unless there's a huge turnaround in Afghanistan, um, I don't see the Russians being particularly helpful there. All right, what about Ukraine? This was one of the topics that reportedly was discussed by Mr. Trump and the Russians. Well, again, and uh, Frank has had some good lectures here on Ukraine, so I won't 
repeat it, but just for those of you who might not have heard, do you remember what happened? Uh, Yanukovych, who had been the uh, president of Ukraine, elected in 2010, uh, very sympathetic to Russia, uh, turned down a nice offer from the European Union that really, really ticked off a lot of Ukrainians who felt themselves, well, we are really Europeans. Uh, there were demonstrations, shootings, et cetera, and Yanukovych finally fled. Uh, this was seen as a huge blow to Mr. Putin. He responded first by seizing Crimea, and second by intervening in predominantly Russian-speaking section of Ukraine, Donetsk and Luhansk. And that fighting has continued to this day with another flare-up in January. There is something called the Minsk Agreement, actually two Minsk meetings, that calls for ceasefire, the withdrawal of heavy weapons for 15 kilometers, and local elections in Donetsk and Luhansk. But very interesting to watch with how the Russians are playing this. Oh, yeah, we want local elections. But only selected media can be allowed to be in the Russian-supported section. It's sort of like Fox News. Only Fox News is allowed in, not the New York Times or Washington Post or whatever. And Electoral Commission, you know, the commission of 15, but only one from Ukraine itself. So you can see what's going on here is he's fixing the election, and not only that, now the currency in eastern Ukraine, the Russian-dominated section, is now the ruble, not the Ukrainian currency. And Russia has announced it recognizes the passports of the uh, Donetsk group and the Luhansk group. So, you know, wh how are the Russians going to be helpful? I mean, this is one of many continuing low-burner conflicts. There's the Dniester, you know, outside of Moldova, Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. The Russians play this, and anytime they want to heat it up, they do. I think the goal here is destabilizing the Ukrainian government and turning on the pressure. Uh, one could argue that a united and neutral Ukraine might be the best solution. Uh, whether that would come out or not is certainly an open question. All right, what about Syria? Syria is obviously the hot point, and Syria is the area that was discussed by Mr. Trump, and Mr. Lavrov, and Mr. Kislyak at their meeting last week. Well, let's go into the reasons why the Russians intervened in a big way in Syria. Now, they had been supporting Assad all along when the Civil War broke out. They had protected him at the Security Council by vetoing a number of resolutions denouncing his barbarity, et cetera. But Nonetheless, they didn't intervene with their own forces until September of 2015. Why did they do it? And I ask you to keep these issues in mind as you debate whether or not the United States can cooperate with the Russians over Syria. Well, first of all, Assad was losing and losing badly. And by intervening to help him, it was a demonstration that Russia, as a great power, stands by its friends, unlike the United States, who did not stand by Mubarak when Mubarak's regime fell in Egypt. Number two, Russia gained a huge air base right smack in the middle of the coastal area of Syria, as well as an expanded naval base at Tartus, giving them a very nice military position in the Middle East protected, by the way, by SAM 400s, which are very sophisticated anti-aircraft missiles that can dominate the airspace over Syria, over southern Turkey, over Israel, over Jordan. That's a major plus. Number three, Russia, since its planes and rockets were unopposed, used Syria as a great place to train its troops. Lie fire and nobody firing back at you. 
Uh, number four, it's a great place to demonstrate Russian power. Rockets against Assad's enemies from the Caspian Sea. You saw that smoke belching aircraft carrier launching planes <coughs> to attack Assad's enemies. Clear demonstration, Russia is a major power. We're back in the world, important. Related to this is Russia used its intervention in Syria to get out of diplomatic isolation, which it had been put because of its annexation of the Crimea and intervention in eastern Ukraine. Number six, it reinforced ties with Iran. Iran, as you all know, is main supporter of Assad. There had been some friction between Russia and Iran over the, when Medvedev had canceled in 2010 the SAM 300 sale. This certainly overcame the friction, and of course, Putin sent the SAM 300s as well. Now, so far at least, there's been minimum cost in blood and money for a demonstration by Russia that it is a major power in the Middle East, a major power in the world, all of which greatly helps Mr. Putin at home. There were polls taken this last year and then 10 years before that why do you like Mr. Putin now because he's made us a great power? 10 years ago, because he helped us with the economy, which had stagnated under, under Yeltsin, his predecessor. So you have to ask yourself a real question. Is Mr. Putin going to give all of this stuff up by coming to an agreement, all these gains that he's made, by coming to an agreement with the United States over Syria? Let's look at the plan on the table now cooked up by the Russians, the Turks, and the Iranians. Iranian involvement, by the way, is automatically a no-no for the non-jihadi Syrian opposition, still fighting in the north in Idlib and still fighting in the south near the Israeli and Jordanian borders. Okay, four zones, so-called safe zones, that A, won't be attacked, and B, the UN can bring in supplies and at some point some point, refugees could return to. Okay, on the surface, maybe not a horrible deal, but every other time there's been a ceasefire, the Syrians have not allowed humanitarian aid into these areas. Number one, the Syrians can well, whose army has been badly, badly battered by the war, many desertions, and they've had to depend on Iranian forces and on Hezbollah to do a lot of the fighting. You know, what you do is you take the ceasefire, you build yourself back up, you have access to arms, you have access to supplies, the rebels do not, and then you go from one of these safe zones to another, reestablishing Assad's control. That's the reason, one of the reasons why the rebels won't have anything to do with it. Uh, and certainly the jihadis who are not even mentioned in this agreement want nothing to do with it. And the pre one of the deals here said that everybody has to fight al-Qaeda in its various incarnations in Syria and ISIS. The Syrian government can say, well, if the non-jihadi people up in Idlib in the north don't fight al-Qaeda and don't fight ISIS, they violated the agreement. Now, how is Mr. Trump going to play that? A very interesting question. So in summary then, before we open for questions, let me make the following points. One, on the part of his past behavior, not only is Mr. Putin not a friend of the United States, but I think he qualifies as an enemy and as an aside why Mr. Trump would share classified information with an enemy is totally beyond me, but I'll, leave, I'll let that go. Number two, Mr. Putin is not credible at all keep times when the Russians have intervened or done something. He's denied it 
basically, he tends to lie a lot. And three, with the possible exception of Libya, given what Russia wants in the world and what the U.S. hopefully wants in the world, I don't see the chances for a lot of cooperation. And on that very happy note, <laughs> let me stop and open for questions. And Frank, if you would do the honors again. The floor is open for questions. Yes, sir, in the rear. The, the question is, first of all, would you take steps of some kind to counter what the Russians are doing? And if so, what would those steps be? OK, again, very good question. It should be clear right at the beginning that a lot of the Russian gains in the Middle East are due to mistakes by the United States. Uh, it got so bad, in my view, that uh, last November, and you can download this for free, I wrote a piece for the Marine Corps uh, Middle East Studies section called Russian Policy in the Middle East 2015 to 2016, Pushing on an Open Door. Because Mr. Obama is a 21st century thinker, and Mr. Putin is a 19th century thinker, that is, balance of power. And I could go down the list, but I'll just do a few and then show how maybe Mr. Trump can counter this. In Egypt, in 2013, you might remember that there was a military coup ousting a Muslim Brotherhood leader, Mohammed Morsi, okay? That coup was supported by millions and millions of Egyptians who took to the streets calling for Morsi's ouster and supporting Sisi. At the time, the US wasn't sure how to react. In his 21st century thinking, Mr. Obama said, you know, if it looks like a coup and smells like a coup, it is a coup. So he cut off military aid, partially cut off military aid to the Egyptians. OK. Now, the Egyptians at the time were fighting ISIS in the Sinai Peninsula. No sooner had the US done that than Mr. Putin came in with major offers of military aid, support, and the Russians are going to be selling uh, helicopters to the Egyptians who bought the Mistral helicopter carrier from the French after the French <coughs> denied it to the Russians you know, following the annexation of Crimea. So the first thing we would do I think. And interestingly enough, I think Mr. Trump has started that, is starting to warm up relations with General Sisi. I mean, the problem with General Sisi is, is that he started with a fairly wide base of support in Egypt. And it's got narrower and narrower and narrower as he's thrown people in jail. Now, Mr. Trump does not believe very much in human rights. But he wants a good, warm, personal relationship with the Egyptians, so I would, if I would want a low-cost way of doing this, I would go back to CC. Mr. Trump said he wants to visit Egypt, and what the Egyptians need are more helicopters and other things to fight ISIS in the Sinai Desert, and I would step up American aid to counterbalance the slide that Egypt has made to, uh, to the Russians. That would be the first thing I would do. Uh, second thing I would do is not buy into this uh, deal that the Russians are cooking up in Syria, but find a way to provide some military aid to the non-jihadist forces fighting in Syria. Make it more expensive for Mr. Assad and more expensive for the Russians. Now, I'm not going so far as to say any aircraft missiles, because those could disappear and be used against us somewhere. But any tank missiles and other things, you know, which would make Assad's life and the Russian life in Syria uh, a lot more difficult. I would also encourage commandos to go attack the not American commandos, but Syrian uh, opposition commandos to try to attack the Russian air base in Syria to emphasize their costs involved to the Russians for doing this. So that would be number two. Uh, number three, I guess, would be on the Arab-Israeli thing. You've got to get both sides talking again. When they don't talk, things degenerate. And uh, I think he's on his way to try to do this. 
I think Mr. Abbas is in such a weak condition. He's 82 years old. There's a succession struggle there to who's going to replace him. Uh, I think at least pushing both sides together to get them talking, um, and which would thrust the United States back into the center of Middle East diplomacy, something that was abdicated by Obama in 2014, you know, would be specifically helpful. Fourth, and this is what he's already doing, is a tough position on Iran. I mean, if there's anything that alienated America's friends in the Middle East, whether it's the Saudis or the Israelis, kind of interesting to put them in the same breath, I think, um, is the clear tilt that Obama had toward the Iranians. Well, you want to restore it the other way, which would do something to reassure both the Israelis and the Saudis, which would in turn help them to cooperate a little bit more in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. So these are a few things I would do right off the top. And I think Trump is interesting in, in a couple of these is already beginning to move in these directions. Would you comment on Putin's strategies with respect to China and India? In India, there was a long period of Soviet-Indian cooperation, which was kind of ironic because India was and is a democracy and the Soviet Union clearly was not. But as part of that, it was obviously anti-Pakistan and to a lesser extent anti-India, particularly after 1962 when China and India fought. Uh, it was an arms relationship, basically. And that arms relationship has continued, although in recent years the, the Indians have become more and more demanding of higher and higher quality goods. Plus, the Indians are now, especially under Modi, uh, the current prime minister, looking to the Israelis for arms. They bought $2 billion a year of arms from the Israelis, moving to the U.S., and the U.S. hopes to set up this giant India, Australia, leaving out the Philippines now, uh, South Korea, Japanese alignment against, um, against China. And uh, the U.S., I think, is hoping to do this. Now, again, Mr. this was in process before Mr. Trump took over. Trump, Mr. Trump is now evaluating Asian strategy. But I think that's it. And you want to throw Vietnam in there, too, you can. Um, he's, all of these are worried about China in one way or another. So that's India. In the case of China, you have what I call tactical allies, not strategic allies, despite the fact they call them that. Uh, China, interesting enough, six months ago, the foreign ministry published a list of all of its, the key players it saw in the world. And number one was the United States, number two was Russia. And um, basically, the Russians in the 1990s kept their arms companies alive by selling to China. That ended in the early stage of the Putin era when Mr. Putin realized the Chinese were retrofitting and taking Russian planes, buying four of them, and, and making Chinese planes on the same model and selling them elsewhere. Uh, then it shifted uh, as China needed huge amounts of energy. And they were dickering and dickering and dickering on energy. Uh, at which point the Chinese got tired of the Russians dickering because, and, and they went to Central Asia. So they made major deals with the Kazakhs, the Uzbeks, and the Turkmen to get pipeline energy across. Now, from the Chinese perspective, uh, having natural gas and oil piped across Central Asia to them is a real bonus, because right now they got most of it has to come by ship from the Persian Gulf. And if there was a conflict with the United States, those ships could be interdicted. So that's it. So now, after 2012, remember, is a turning point here that I mentioned in my lecture. The Russians decided they needed the Chinese more than the Chinese needed them. So they went ahead with some major energy deals. But more important, 
decided to sell them the SAM-400 anti-aircraft missiles and the Sukhoi-35, which is their most advanced fourth-generation plane. So now they're cooperating. If you remember, as <laughs> Mr. Putin attended the uh, kickoff of the One Belt, One Road thing in Beijing the other day, there were images of him by task playing, you know, some Russian music there as he was sitting alone. Um, the bottom line, if I'm sitting in Moscow, is this. Central Asia, that is the stands, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. That's the soft underbelly of Russia. That's their strategic area. The problem is the Chinese are making huge economic inroads into that area. And basically, they're going to detach that area from Russian control in the not too distant future. That's why I call them tactical allies against the United States, but long run, who knows? Two questions, really. Would you comment on sanctions, the, their effectiveness, and then what kind of trust might result at the end? How much could you trust Russia? Well, the question is, let's say the U.S. lifts sanctions on what ExxonMobil wants to do, which is to drill baby drill in the Black Sea and up in the Arctic that was stopped. Okay, so we lift that sanctions. Those sanctions were put into place, among other sanctions, by the EU because the Russians intervened in eastern Ukraine and in Crimea. Are the Russians going to pull out of Crimea if they do this? Are the Russians going to pull out of eastern Ukraine? Uh, are they going to honor the Minsk Agreement, which is being floated by some Europeans? Well, if you honor the Minsk Agreement, then maybe we'll consider lifting sanctions. Um, I just don't see it. I think uh, one of the things that's happened here is that the Russians have countersanctioned EU agricultural exports uh, to Russia and are trying to grow more stuff themselves. Now, of course, they run into problems because people are starting trying to smuggle French cheese into Russia and they get, they get <laughs> thrown in jail. But, you know, it's really, there's pretty much zero-sum game. And unless they can finesse the Minsk agreement, which I haven't seen, I mean, Chancellor Merkel was just in Sochi in Russia. She had a long talk with Putin about this. They talked about, gee, we've got to observe the Minsk deal, which I mentioned. But the Russian response was, yeah, but we've got to, effectively, we've got to control the elections in eastern Ukraine so our people you know, are elected. Uh, I don't see it yet. A couple of uh, questions. The first, <laughs> the, the first I think is to, uh, to comment upon uh, the degree to which you're making positive comments about various efforts that President Trump is attempting to make, mostly under the aegis of a more muscular policy. And uh, then, uh, well, number with two. respect to uh, uh, suggesting that we embrace some of the more notorious uh, leaders yeah. in the globe at this point in time. And, and the second one, and I, uh, the Secretary of State has recently commented that uh, we pursue our interests, uh, national security and economics, and treat uh, uh, human rights and other things as best we can and that we will not be um, held back by uh, considerations of the internal regimes. Would you comment upon that facet? Yeah, as I mentioned, and it's a very good question, the dilemma is this. Mm -hmm. President Obama caused a lot of damage to the United States in the Middle East by his policies. The Iran nuclear deal, I thought, was a good deal, by the way, aside, although parenthetically, I think the, there were some assumptions on the Iran nuclear deal that Obama had that were just simply not correct. The people close to him with whom I spoke while the deal was being negotiated stated that Rouhani then and perhaps in another week again president assured him that if the nuclear deal is signed, all the bad things that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard was doing and all the mischief that Iran was doing in the Middle East, that would come to an end. Well, it's clear it hasn't. And I think the President might have been sold a Brooklyn Bridge, you know, on that one. However, let's go to the other damage. 
General Sisi certainly has been trampling on human rights. There's absolutely no question. The point I was making is that the Obama administration had so alienated him, General Sisi, instead of meeting with him right after the coup and suggesting, look, this is where you can go and we're going to help you, you know, just treating it as strictly a military coup, even though it had millions and millions and millions of Egyptians on the streets supporting him because Morsi was about to do what Erdogan has done in, in Turkey, create an Islamic dictatorship in Turkey. That's was, if you look at the timing, that was going to happen. The dilemma is that Sisi has, as I mentioned, whittled down and narrowed and narrowed his base of support. It's damage control now for the United States. Ultimately, human rights has got to be taken in consideration. Tillerson is, is wrong on this. But at this point, Egypt is needed for two or three things. First of all, you don't want them to fall and back into the arms of the Russians. Two, they need to be helpful on the Israeli-Palestinian agreement. And third, they're needed as a counterbalance to Iran. Now, this may all not sound well in the human rights world in which we live, 21st century world. The Middle East is a 19th century region of the world. So. Two, two questions, <laughs> friendly questions. Uh, number one, why did Mr. Trump uh, ever uh, hire Mr. Flynn? And secondly, why did he fire Mr. Comey? Well, I think he hired Mr. Flynn because Flynn had been fired by the Obama administration, effectively. And he was one of the few security guys to come out early for Trump, when most of my colleagues wanted nothing to do with Trump. Uh, but the more interesting question is, what about Comey? And I'll give you my theory, and I guess you have to climb into <coughs> Mr. Trump's mind to find out what really happened. But if you remember, the Senate Intelligence Committee was due to have open and then secret hearings. Mr. Comey was due to testify. I think Mr. Trump was scared to death that Comey, who couldn't be bullied, he was a big, bigger guy than Trump. And you know, if you read some of the media these days, uh, he didn't want Trump, he didn't want Comey because he was bigger than Trump. He was afraid that Comey was going to say some things to tighten the connection between the Trump administration and the Russians who were interfering in the election. The irony is, of course, as I, I quoted McCabe here, uh, when Trump tried to play down and he said, oh, it was the Russian reason I you know, got rid of him. Sir, that was the reason he got rid of him. But McCabe said, and well, Trump was saying, no, this is a minor thing. No, this is a major thing that we're working on. So it did not redound in the long run to, or at least the short run, to Mr. Trump's benefit. What, what's your guess about the future of Russia after Putin? Well, you know, as, as historians love to say, it's a lot easier to predict the past than it is to <laughs> predict the future. Um, it's an open question. I mean, you still have a civil society there, even though it's been suppressed. And I guess it depends on who's going to take over. I mean, Putin can literally stay in power until 2026. Um, he's certainly considering running in 2018. That's why he's had attacks on Alexei Navalny and others uh, who have opposed him. Um, the problem is Russian political culture is such, and now I'm going back hundreds and hundreds of years, it's a highly centralized culture. And built into everybody Russian's mind is, we've been invaded from the east, we've been invaded from the west, we've got to be highly centralized and strong to prevent us from being invaded again and to be a great power. And this is, this is the political culture which really elevated Putin and so forth. So I would be afraid if uh, another ex-KGB, if not Czechist, uh, would be, um, Likely, the, the dilemma is the corruption is so bad in Russia. Um, a friend of mine, Karen Derisha, has written a book on, on corruption in Russia, which is worth looking at. Uh, and that's what the people are taking to the streets to fight. And um, 
he's got it centralized that all of the oligarchs who control the key industries that are not controlled by his own ex-KGB or military people. It's a highly centralized system. Um, if I may take one minute to tell a quick story. 2007, uh, before it was clear that, that Putin was not going to run again and they're thinking somebody else. I happened to be in, in Eastern Europe uh, traveling and I ran into one of the minor oligarchs. And I asked him, well, what's going to happen in 2008? And a very interesting response he gave me. He said, look, our problem is this. We know who the thieves are now. We're just not sure who the thieves are going to be after 2008. And that's, that says something. Years ago, the council had the first ambassador of, the, of Russia to the United States, Mr. Lukin. And he said bluntly in answering a question, we don't understand the rule of law which is a kind of a grand summary. Russians can be disarmingly blunt at times about their own weaknesses as well as strengths, of course. One last question, Mr. Shore. Uh, who's looking at the mere fact that Russia is the g largest nation in the world uh, when considering their security policies? Again, a very good question, but again, you have to put yourself in the mindset of the Russians. They're back to the 1700 borders before Peter the Great conquered Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Um, one last very short story. In, in 1991, I was invited down to talk to Central Command. Uh, they are responsible for the, for the Middle East, and they added Central Asia to that. And uh, there are a few of us scholars down there talking about what should Central Command do, because the general was about to go to the region. And I suggested to him before he goes to Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan in particular, because those are the big countries there, what should be done is he should go to Moscow, talk to his colleagues in their Ministry of Defense and say, look, we're not trying to take over your former patrimony. We want to coordinate with these people against terrorism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And after I finished my talk, one of the young officers who was an aide to the general came up to me and said, we've been trying to tell the general that, but he hasn't been listening. Thank you very much. Did he listen to me? No. <laughs> I hope you have observed, absorbed every word of this. Bob, we thank you again for a, a masterful presentation. Thanks so much.